Uh, but we look at some of those uh, dimensionality <coughs> regression techniques which are commonly used in, in machine learning. Uh, uh, one of them is PCA, uh, 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 or principal component analysis. It's used very commonly in, in, uh, in machine learning and also in image processing in particular. Have you come across PCA before? Um, again, I, I thought it's a, it's a good idea to look at PCA because it might give you some idea again for analyzing basically or uh, doing a dimensionality reduction. The idea of uh, a principal component analysis is looking at data and identifying uh, areas in data which has the most var variance in terms of direction and trying to find basically principal uh, components can represent that. Wasn't a good definition. Let me show you an example and we'll tell you. Uh, let's say if we have a data set which uh, x and y axes uh, show the x is, let's say, age, and this is number of hours people spend on internet. And we have a set of data. This is a two dimensional data. Let's say uh, I, I draw it. Didn't draw it. Let's say this is hours and this is age. And we have number of uh, number of people we have their data and we look at how much time they spend on internet. Let's say by different age we put it if they are younger, probably they spend more time. It's not correct, but we'll look at this. And if you have our data distribution is something like this. Like we want to find a be able to draw a line in our data and find where is the most variance in our data if we draw a line to separate this data. I'm looking at in this direction, try to draw a line. I'm trying to find it like two principal components to represent this data. Let's say if I draw my line somewhere close to here, but that's not a good color. If I draw a line around along here, I use the same color again. Uh, uh, my variance here is it doesn't vary. Here varies a lot because my data, my information, are vary a lot compared to this line. But here I don't have the best variance, right? They are very close. You are looking for be able to draw a line which gives us the most variance across all the data sets we have. If we can find that line, that will be our principal component. Here in our example, uh, you can see the be best one. I draw it on purpose in that shape because that will make my life easier to draw a line which gives you the best uh, um, separation. If you take this line, got to be a straight line. With my hand uh, that line probably will give you the best variance between in, in basically representing your data, or representing the very variation in your data. And that's a principal component. And there are mathematical or methods to be able to find the principal components in your data. And if you find that principal components, you can represent your data in, in lower dimensions. I do it in x-axis, I can uh, draw it in y-axis. And you can see uh, where it's going to be. Now you can easily guess, right? My very y-axis would be probably here because if you take this data, the distances are probably will give me the maximum var variation. Distances in the y-axis will be towards here. And these two blue lines in, uh, looking like a plus sign will be my principal components. And I can then represent my data uh, based on this. will be basically changing my uh, axis to a new axis to represent my data. And my new data now can be represented across the new axis. And instead of having that data which was distributed in in a model which I couldn't separate my data, now my data can be easily separated across that axis. Let me go back to my example. 
Here I had hour and age, and my data was distributed in a way which I wanted to separate my data and be able to create like a way of separating my data in an easier way. What, what we do, we go and find our data, some principal components, and we change our axis. Now the new lines, which are our principal components, becomes my new X and Y. The only difference is now, the previous X and Y, they meant something. They meant age and hour of the, uh, people who spend on the internet. This new X and Y, they don't mean anything in terms of the expression of the language. These are the principal components, basically uh, axis is designed based on the principal components. But we allow my data to be now easier separable, I can process my data, and also I can use data across a certain, if I have multiple principal components, I might choose only a few of them and represent my data in the lower dimensions. Here I just showed all the principal components, but I might come and say, you know, instead of actually representing my data now across two axes, X and Y, it seems most of my data actually is differing alongside Y. If I get up rid of X, still I can represent my data in a very good representative. And that's how we start losing dimensions in our data by preserving more information. That was a very quick overview of PCA. Did I explain it clearly? Do I need to repeat what it does? Can you map it to any mathematical model can do something like this? No, I have a question. Of course, this is when you have a strong correlation between within the data. Otherwise, uh, uh, that's correct. That will look at if you have some underlying structure in your data. I said that you use it in image processing because in image processing, usually the neighboring pixels, if you go up, box from left and right, usually the color intensity or the, the, the basically there's a correlation between the pixels next to each other. If you take a picture, if there's a highly likely the pixels next to each other will have similar color, similar intensity. And that's how we can use, for example, principal component analysis to find this uh, and identify, use basically exploit these correlations. And sometimes in our data also there is an underlying structure and underlying correlation which we can use them. Once we uh, take our data from our normal distribution, our normal representation, to transform it to a principal component representation, we can see around which principal components our data has the highest variance. And basically that principal components could be the best representative of data and around the components which we don't have much vari variation, we might get rid of them. Let's say if our data has 50 dimensions, if you are collecting data with lots of uh, 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 accesses, lots of dimensions, I showed a two-dimensional example, but if I had a data which had number of hours people spend on the internet, their age, their income, where they live, where they have traveled before, I, I, I don't know how many computers they have, how many years they have studied, how many books they read per year, and so on. I had a large number of data. Now if I start creating my principal components and draw my principal components across all the lines and find the lines which they don't have much variation across them, I can get rid of those components because they are not much, then my data doesn't work very across those lines very much. It seems like, let's say, in terms of if you're looking at the predicting number of hours people are going to spend on internet, it seems that the number of books they read per year has nothing to do with the number of hours they spend on it. But a very intuitive example would be something like that. And then if you do that, you get rid of basically some of them. You can basically drop some of those principal components which the variation across them is not that high. And those are which they vary a lot they seem to be a better representative. It seems like there is actually a correlation between the number of uh, trips people have made, and I, I don't know how much they spend on the internet, which there is a problem, uh, uh, and then you say, oh, that could be a good representative. Basically what PCA does is a dimensionality reduction technique, which will look at your data, will try to find uh, a, a new ways of representing it in, in a, a transformation, in a principal component, uh, uh, basically, model, and then you look at the components which the variation is not that high and you drop them. Can you link it to any mathematical model which can give you that uh, representation? Because I said, I show you my example, my data varied is something like this. And I basically intuitively looked at and I said if I draw a line here, it would give me the maximum uh, 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 the variation because the way I draw it was easy to, for me to draw that line. But if I have a really complex data, is something like this. Maybe drawing that line is not that easy. 
do you think can you think of any method which can help you to to f help to find the principal components because here is easy to see drawing a line here will maximizes the variation in average since that, that gives us the best if i go below we'll be closer to the other points we'll be far from the others that will give me the best probably the variation here is a bit complex where should i draw my line should it come like this should be here should be a little higher should be a little lower what angle i should draw it it's a bit complex uh any, any mathematical model you can think of Eigenvalues and eigenvectors. Minimum squares. Yeah. Uh, uh, could be, but uh, ECA uses eigenvalues. Uh, you can use well, a sort of a, a representation of uh, 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 eigenvectors and eigenvalues. Do I need to explain what eigenvalues and eigenvectors are? If you have a matrix, uh, 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 an eigen uh, basically vector of it will be showing on each dimension what is the almost the uh, Say the interpolation or average of in each dimension and how much it is. And for each eigen, eigen, eigens, they come in pairs, eigenvalues and eigenvectors. The value will show the basically intensity of it, and the uh, vector will show the direction. Mm -hmm. And what you do, if you take the eigen uh, pairs of eigenvalues and eigenvectors, again, you can look at the eigenvalues which are small, if you drop them, and keep only the eigenvectors which they have higher eigenvalue, basically you are creating a representative of your matrix, of your data, uh, across the dimensions which are providing the higher variance to your data. Uh, if you take the same concept, uh, this already explains what I said, I already drew it, I've already done that, explain 50 direction, uh, 50 dimensions and how we can use it. Of course, we can use now uh, eigenvalues and uh, 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 associated eigenvectors to represent a higher dimensional data in a lower dimension, right? PCA already does that, but it's a very commonly known technique. There are lots of uh, uh, variations of PCA that has been used for years. And one thing I uh, didn't mention in PCA, usually the uh, uh, the axes are perpendicular to each other. They make a 90 degree uh, uh, angle. There are variations of PCA which these angles are not necessarily 90 degrees. There is one that's called ACA, Independent Component Analysis. If you're interested, uh, you can go and look it up. And uh, they have lo lots of interesting applications this dimensionality uh, reduction techniques based on PCA, ICA, in, in machine learning, and lot lots of uh, different data analysis. For our purpose, we are interested in uh, looking at, can we use ideas from uh, techniques similar to PCA or eigenvalues in dimensionality reduction for our sensory data? The only challenge is now, the, uh, uh, the data we have, time series data, if you take just one that data, temperature data, is a single vector, it's not a <laughs> matrix. What eigenvalues work, or pairs of eigenvalues, eigenvectors work, usually you need a matrix. Any idea how what we can do? Any suggestions? This is the similar example we had in SACS. Now we have we are trying to solve the same problem in a different uh, way, in a different techniques. We are not representing in symbolic, we are looking for some mathematical representation, some vector base. So far we looked at the, the common uh, the, the, the start a lot common machine learning techniques, PCA, which takes and uh, is used for dimensionality reduction and works based on uh, uh, basically axes which provides the highest variance in our data and we can look at the dimensions which across them we don't have much high variance and we uh, reduce them. If we can apply a similar concept to our uh, time series data, we might create an interesting algorithm based on that. The only problem so far we have got, we know if we have a matrix, if I have a matrix and I have a, a number of rows, and I can take a set of uh, eigenvalues and eigenvectors, which we say we said they come in pairs. We can look at the eigenvalues which they have high, high basically uh, intensity, and then take those eigenvectors vectors would be representative of this matrix across that dimension, right? Can you think of applying that technique to our time series data? Because you're interested in the vector. 
take each segment as a vector, put them in a matrix. Once you do that, now you have a, a matrix representation. Now our task is now to find, this is an n-dimensional representation, right? This is an n, -dimension, n number of data sets in n dimensions. Can I find the best way to represent it in a lower dimension? Let's say if my dimension here, the number of samples you take in each fragment, let's say I have taken, I think, 8 by 8, and if my, I have an 8 by 8 data, can I represent it, for example, with one vector, which shows these are lots of samples like sensory data. Can I represent it with one vector, which almost will tell me what is the average of all this data in an n-dimensional world? Let's say if you, oh, those vectors are each one person going in, in an n-dimensional world in different directions, what is the average movement of those 10 to 8 people overall? Uh, well, you take the component, which is the, not, not that, when I said that, average is not maybe a good word, it is the, the overall direction. Let's say if each of, we have an n-dimensional wall, you are moving in, here is eight-dimensional. In each row, we are moving in each, and we are in a point in that eight-dimensional uh, wall. And now we have eight of them. Overall, if you want to look at overall, how, Direction, which directions they are moving, how can we calculate that? Let's, uh, if I put a, a two directional example, it would be clear. Let's take two vectors. In a two dimensional world, these are two vectors. Right? What would be the overall? If I have two vectors, if imagine if there are two cars moving in two directions like this, if I want to find the overall direction of their movement based on just, just two samples, what will, be, will it be? The sum? What do they do? Sorry, I clicked on something. I don't know what. Okay. Uh, sort of will be here, right? The first time they look at the sun. Sorry? Just product? Dot, dot, sort of, yeah, dot product of it. We did dot product of it, the direction they are moving. Because one moving in this state, one moving the other way, the dot product will show overall which state they are moving. Is the sum of vectors? No, it's, it's not just, I, I don't think it's so. I think it's the dot vector of the. Uh, uh, See, the sum of the two vectors. Well, if you sum it up, you, you mm -hmm. mm -hmm. basically your, your uh, magnitude will increase. You are not summing them up, you are looking at the dot product. Uh, Let's say if I'm pulling something yeah. this direction yeah. and somebody is pulling it in the other direction, maybe the mm -hmm. car wouldn't help. If, if I'm taking this, and someone is pulling it this direction, somebody is pulling this direction, depending on the intensity, which way will it go? Maybe it goes a little this way, maybe it goes with an angle that way, right? That, that's the same thing. Now that was in a two-dimensional world. If we have an n-dimensional world and we had n of them, how do we calculate in which direction they're going to move? Uh, well, uh, it's a little more complex than that. The best probably is you find the, you calculate the, 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 the eigenvalues and you find the uh, eigenvector which has the highest dimension. That will give you an n-dimensional world, the, the overall uh, the direction of your matrix. And that's exactly what we did uh, a few years ago. We took our data, we took all this uh, sensory readings which were coming from, uh, let's say, these measurements were coming like this. We divided them to equally uh, probably areas. Each area we took eight samples, eight samples, and we put each each set of the samples became a row. One, two, three, four, five, six, one, one, one. Yeah, what's your other one here? The next one becomes my next row. One, one. One, one, one. I'm just making it easier for me. This will be two, 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 and so on. Each row becomes one of those segments, and we took eight by eight of them, and we calculate the eigenvalues. And once we had calculated the uh, eigenvalues, we looked at the eigenvalue which has the highest representation and took the eigenvector equivalent to that, and that would be an overall representation of your data. And that's the technique. But before doing that, 
we also applied a discrete cosine transform. If you're familiar, if you take your data from basically uh, time domain to frequency domain, and we quantize that to be able to keep only the highest higher frequencies. Mm -hmm. And we represented our data <coughs> first in the frequency domain, and then we calculated the eigenvalues. And the result was, if I had 8 by 8, 64 samples, uh, once I calculate this and I get the highest eigenvalue, uh, basically I get the eigenvectors and I find the eigenvalue equivalent uh, associated to my highest eigenvalue or to, to the highest, depending on how many data you want to represent it. Instead of 8 by 8, you can represent it by 1 8 vector, 2 8 vector, depending on what you want to do. You have moved from 64 samples to, let's say, 3 to 4 whatever, samples. And that was the work, uh, uh, we had a collaboration and we published a paper on uh, IEEE transactions on knowledge and data engineering, which came up uh, a few months ago. Can you see a, a, a drawback to this work? This work has a problem. How do you decide the, the size of the window? Uh, size of the window, you decide based on you can decide based on some heuristics. We took it uh, obviously you take square matrices because uh, calculating eigenvalues, uh, eigenvectors for uh, square matrices are, are easier. Yeah, is is is, is the, the mechanical one invariant of the size of the, of the window you choose? Uh, in our assumption, we looked at the. Uh, we were, as, uh, in fact, if you read the paper, we mention it. It can be 8 by 8, 16 by 16, 24 by 24, depending on uh, how much data you want to preserve uh, and how many samples you want to put up the data and how much your data changes. Uh, but, but your question is good because you're uh, also answering part of my, my question what is the drawback of this? Because the, the bigger or smaller blocks you take uh, will have an impact on some assumptions you are making. Uh, can anyone spot the problem? Basically, we took a one-dimensional data and we created n-dimensional representation. <laughs> because we took a, a, a one-dimensional data, but then we put it in the row of the matrices. We have now we had only like x-axis. Our data was temperature, just moving it across the values of temperature. Now we have rows and columns. Uh, means the data we are putting here. Now these and these also will have some correlation in my analysis, but analysis, and this appears in a different column, a different row, mm -hmm. and it, it, it across the column, or these and these will have some relations as well, right? And that's an assumption, that's a, 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 a huge assumption, because I took one my dimension, one dimensional data and I created like let's say a two-dimensional data, or you can create an n-dimensional data. This work will be only valid if you are making an assumption in your patterns, the same samples across different rows, your assumption, they have some correlations. This work, this type of work would work with image processing because you're assuming pixels in the neighborhoods. If these were the number pixels, pixels up or bottom in an image will have correlations. And that assumption holds. If you're using it for sensory data, you're making an assumption the second measurement in each fragment seems to be moving, and you're interested in also variation in that second value of a third value or n value in your data. You don't seem to be convinced. Uh, but let me repeat that. Because we had, uh, these are not uh, multi dimensional data, these are continuous data like 1, 7, x. The next one continues. This was a vector with just one vector, just one dimension. Just like when I say one dimension, it was just one vector. I took it and made it now a two-dimensional vector. By slicing my data and creating a two-dimensional vector, I made an assumption in each row I create, the, let's say the i-th number, third number, fourth number, fifth number, the i-th number in each uh, uh, a row has a correlation with the i number in the previous row and the next row. That will hold if your data follows a certain type of pattern and doesn't have too many randomness in your data. But in most of the uh, measurements and most of the uh, uh, evaluations you do for a natural phenomenon, and if your fre frequency of sampling is relatively high, and I say relatively high, if you're monitoring the temperature, it could be every two minutes, that assumption often holds. But if you're monitoring something with longer distances in terms of measurement and your variation in your data is very high, maybe that assumption doesn't hold. 
I just I wanted to say, if you are using a similar method or if you're following this, it's just you have to treat it very carefully. We have explained it. There is a section in our paper we have to describe this, just to be aware. But you can see the, the basic principle of the work is not that complex. We took the, the data, uh, we, we create basically a blocks representations of that data, we apply the strict cosine transform which takes your data from a time dimension to a frequency domain, we quantize it which basically you get rid of the uh, lower frequencies, the data which doesn't appear very often, you get rid of them, and then you calculate the eigenvalues and represent your data using uh, eigenvalues. I don't really understand what you expect to extract making a DCT or in the then when we do DCT, when you do DCT, uh, uh, basically the upper, the lower band, but then you do do CT, what I haven't shown here, we also quantize it. Which have we have shown it actually here, no, correct. And when you quantize it, basically there is a standard, you divide your matrix by a certain values, and all the small numbers will become zero. <laughs> and you create a more sparse matrix, like this matrix will become very sparse, it means most of your data here will stay because they are the higher frequencies, and the smaller frequencies will disappear. Basically, by doing that, you are taking the, the data items which they don't appear very often in your data, you eliminate them. And if you have a noisy data, that will eliminate noise as well, assuming you have a, a, your signal-to-noise ratio. Uh, it, it, it's, it's so basically, you have more signal than noise. If your noise ratio is high, that actually will get you the viewer data will keep the noise. It's just we are assuming our, our signal net, uh, net to noise ratio is high. I mean, it's, it's not as it's, it's, it's balanced. It means we, we have we don't have too noisy data. But if you have some elements of noise, by doing that, you're also getting rid of noise. There are just some signal processing concepts. I, I, I know I didn't explain how the strict cosine transform works, but it's just a, a, a signal to transformation, and we we'll won't have enough time to explain that. But once you do that and you quantize it, in principle, you are keeping the values which they have higher frequency. If like temperature 22 has appeared many, many times, and suddenly you had some blips, your sensor had some error, or someone just, I don't know, blew a hair dryer on your sensor and there were some variations of that which data wasn't uh, very usual and didn't appear very often, your system would get rid of that data. And by doing that, basically, you're also reducing the amount of data you're keeping, and then your eigenvalues can be uh, represented uh, 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 sort of. Uh, you will have less, less values to basically. Any other question? Uh, we are now working on a, a, a new variation of this model. Uh, which uses like Lagrangian multipliers. Probably, uh, it, it, if you are doing some evaluations that get published, I can send it around. Uh, one of the important things about uh, works like this now, we didn't normalize it. Obviously, we did quantize it, we, we should check it at some of the low frequencies, but we didn't look at the now the intensity of data and the variations are also included in that data. In SACS, we started first normalizing it. And these are some experiments. We looked at SACS with different alphabets. We looked at only using eigenvalues. That are, Eigen only refers to using eigenvalues. And BEATS is this algorithm. We called it BEATS. Uh, and my colleague Aurora and our uh, Aurora was doing her PhD with Antonio Scarmetta at the University of Murcia. She came and spent a few months in our group, and that was her basically internship work, which was published recently. And Beats, uh, uh, she called it Beats. The algorithm it shows that like, we tried it with some common data sets, and uh, across this data set, uh, we looked at like uh, some of the data sets. There's our common data sets are available, we took from again Kilk and his colleagues' website. And, we compared it to results with different methods of SACS, with different uh, other techniques, and it showed how uh, it performs compared to other algorithms. And it shows when you have noisy data, most probably because we do quantization, uh, it, it has better performance. What we were doing, I was going to explain, we were clustering data. We were looking at time series data and we were trying to create clusters, looking at how the patterns appear and how you can put patterns in clusters. Now here we have patterns, the only difference is our patterns now are represented as vectors. 
And once you have vector patterns, uh, and most of the or, or machine learning techniques will work kind of vectors very right, well, and you can write lots of algorithms to cluster them, classify them, or kind of do different uh, uh, processes based on this vector representation. But the whole idea was taking lots of samples again continuously appear, and it's difficult <coughs> to interpret them individually, create patterns, and those patterns are good representative of your data, which you can use it in different methods and different techniques to analyze them. I talked a lot about clustering, but I didn't say actually how clustering <coughs> methods work. Uh, uh, obviously, there are different techniques for clustering. Some of them are density-based. Some of them are the, uh, uh, distribution ba uh, density and distribution-based. Some of them are distance-based. Uh, there are different techniques like a Gaussian mixture model, which works on multivariate data. But a few years ago, we wanted to create a, a, a clustering mechanism for IoT data, but we had an assumption. Uh, we wanted to analyze traffic data. This is city of Aarhus uh, in Denmark. That's the second biggest city in Denmark. And we had access to some sensors. We were doing a joint project with them. And these are the uh, intensity of traffic. This, like the, this is a heat map. When you get red to the show, there are more cars in the area. We wanted to create a, a clustering mechanism to uh, 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 look at our data and cluster the traffic patterns based on moving traffic, uh, like heavy traffic, low traffic, and put them in different clusters. Uh, up to here is, it, uh, is like you create your patterns, you run a clustering mechanism. I think we were using uh, k-means, which is a distance space. You start assigning some uh, centroids, and you decide how many clusters you have, and you assign your data to those clusters. The only difference we wanted to have is, if during the day, in this part of the town, you have 100 cars, that could be a normal traffic, because that's a main street and 100 cars, it seems to be a, a, a normal pattern of traffic. If it's 3 in the morning, and if you had 100 cars in the entire town, and 60 of them were here, we wanted to highlight that and say this is an unusual traffic. We wanted to create an algorithm which the centroids and the method of clustering adapted it itself based on the distribution of that data. It's like here, instead of having a, like a, a fixed clustering mechanism, we wanted to look at how the clustering algorithms could be uh, adapted. To do that, we started looking at the distribution of data. And based on the distribution of data, when the, we started finding, uh, basically, when the distribution started changing. And every time we uh, find a change, we start readjusting our centroids for our clusters in different uh, 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 areas in our cluster. It means, in terms of the classic way of evaluating clusters, we're putting apple, uh, apples and oranges in the same cluster over the time, but uh, Probably we were putting things which were inconsistent, like during the day, maybe 100 cars would have gone to low traffic, but at night, maybe 100 cars in an area would have gone to unusual traffic. But in the context of our application, that made sense, because we had created an algorithm which was adaptive, and was looking at what's happening around it, and was deciding to categorize our data, label our data, put our data in clusters based on a, a, a variation of that data. That algorithm worked, then we only looked at the traffic. We had one dimensional data because we were looking at the distributions. We were looking at the uh, uh, distribution of data and we we're finding the changes across this data and we we're adjusting the centroids of our cluster based on changing in that. When we had, we added now, we were looking only at number of cars. Then we started adding uh, uh, speed of the cars, I don't know, some other parameters, number of parking slots available, and so on. We started creating multi-dimensional data. And this is the raw data, how they are distributed. And separating them and creating basically centuries for the clusters and deciding how they should move on wasn't an easy task. Because now you were not just looking at distribution across only velocity of cars, you were looking at the distribution across the number of cars, across the, I don't know, the, 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 uh, air quality and across different things. What we did, we started looking at these distributions. Uh, first, you take your data, obviously, you uh, calculate the, uh, this is how we calculated basically the probability uh, distribution function, or uh, we use the kernel estimation to uh, take our data and basically generate these distributions for representing our data. And our idea was, can we use now this distribution to divide our data 
ideally be able to separate our data uh, uh, in a more effective way. To do that, we started looking at e each dimension. This is a distribution in my dimension y, and this is dimension x. Dimension x, for example, is velocity, and this is the numbers. For each of them, we started looking at the distribution of data as the distribution changes. And for each of those changes, we looked at whenever they changed, we started changing the centroid. Like this is changing across x. But at the same time, we started also looking at the changes across y, uh, x and y together, and we looked at the points which they met. And those became the points where we started moving our centroid. Then the decision making to change our centroids wasn't based on just one dimension, based on looking at the how our probability distribution across different dimensions changed. And that allowed us to create a more adaptive uh, clustering, a dynamic clustering mechanism, and at the same time to be sensitive to different dimensions. Basically, this is a clustering mechanism over time, keeps moving its centroid, uh, how, depending on how your data changes. If you have done any machine learning, well, like use any clustering mechanism, you will have some representatives of how, especially the distance based measures have a representative of your centroids. Here you start adjusting your centroids based on how your data changes and you keep moving it around. When we did this, we had a, 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 an interesting observation. I call that uh, accidental science. When my student was uh, doing this experiment, he was uh, uh, comparing his work with some of the state-of-the-art works like ProStream, DenStream, which are uh, in stream, these are the uh, 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 so, sorry, cluster stream is our work, ministry and industry. It, we were comparing it to some state of the art work which are integrated in a, a software tool called MOA. Have you come across that? Uh, MOA is, uh, is, is a tool from uh, University of Waikato in New Zealand, and they have a very, it's a very interesting, it's a very useful tool for, times, uh, for uh, analyzing uh, basically streaming data. Uh, it's an open source library, it's an interface, you can, there are lots of existing algorithms that are already built into the system, you can run and uh, analyze your data. To evaluate our technique, we were using some of the algorithms built in, in, in uh, MOA, and uh, we were feeding the same data we had to algorithms in MOA, and we were measuring silhouette coefficient. Again, if you have done clustering, there are different ways of uh, measuring the, uh, how good your clusters are. One of measures is called silhouette coefficient, and what silhouette coefficient does, you will take each sample in your cluster and you measure the distance of this across the, uh, the samples, across the, uh, the, the cluster and across the other clusters, the neighboring clusters. And you find uh, uh, how good, if your, like, your distances are optimum, you will find that, that you will say your, your clustering mechanism works very well. And this uh, varies between minus one and plus one. Obviously, closer to plus one you are, the better your uh, cluster mechanism works. When we were evaluating it, you can see that like our algorithm is somewhere here, plus six, and these are the results here, and over here, here, and the other algorithms uh, change. Yes, that's correct. An algorithm changes, and the other algorithms change here. For a long time, anything we measured, we were not getting good results. And we really, really spent a lot of time to look at, and we came up with this idea, we changed it many times, this was many, many iterations we had, and still when we were evaluating it against more, we were not getting the, with every time this algorithm seemed to be performing better. We were almost close to give up, and I just somehow, I don't know what happened, I asked my student to show me the source code of MOA, the open source, uh, it was an open source toolkit, and I went and looked at how they were calculating silhouette coefficient. Someone writing that silhouette coefficient in MOA had decided to scale it instead of minus one and one, to change it between zero and one. In our code, we will still, uh, calculating it between minus one and one, and they had scaled it up, shifted it a little bit towards up. And obviously, anything we were doing, we still be getting a, a relatively lower result. And as soon as we also started scaling ourselves and uh, making it up, we saw there was a huge difference between our results and some of the existing algorithms. Sometimes I just mention this because 
uh, we would have just given up. We thought maybe actually it doesn't work. Maybe our idea is not good. But actually the problem was somewhere else. The problem was the way we were looking at the evaluation results. Sometimes when an algorithm you want to test it, uh, if it doesn't work or if you're not getting good results, maybe it's better to go back on the data you've collected or the process chain actually, how you start with treating that data and processing that data to get that result. Maybe the problem is somewhere else. That was a good lesson for me. Actually, the problem was in the way we collected data, the way we were looking at uh, analyzing it. Uh, one last uh, topic, change detection. Most of the things I mentioned so far were looking at the data, looking at the patterns, looking at the variation of data, finding symbolic representations, looking at uh, uh, numerical methods to represent that data. Uh, there are also solutions looking at uh, 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 you can find changes in data, like change points on that data, and then you can use it for different purposes, like for example, for activity recognition, uh, fire detection or fault detection. If you have a uh, time series data from one sensor on the left hand side, then we are interested to find, especially if your data varies a lot, which part of that actually will see there is a change in your data. For example, there is a change here, basically finding local maximas and local minimas and saying these are the change points in data. And this represents each color here are different sensors, looking at how can we find the change points in that data. There are different techniques. A very old one and very commonly still used and lots of uh, people who work in the change detection will still probably compare their work to, uh, to it. It's called QSUM, which is cumulative sum. Looking at cumulative differences between the successive values. You start basically looking at each value and you start looking at the next one, next one, and you start looking at the differences. And then at some point, the new difference suddenly gets higher than a certain value, you put it as a change point. Let's say you read the value, you calculate the mean. You read the next value, you calculate the mean. You continuously do that, and then you look at the difference between the mean and the difference of the value you have read. And when your value goes from a, a certain value higher, you take it and you call it a, a change. And then from there, then you restart again and you start calculating again. This is a very simple and effective way for change detection. And obviously you need to look at changes like some of the parts of the uh, algorithm sometimes only detect the changes in one direction, only when the data increases. Also you need to look at when the data decreases because only if you look at the increased threshold, you need to look at both directions. The call it like two-directional change detection. Uh, uh, basically finding the, again, uh, uh, local optima and local minima. Mm -hmm. Difference is equal to uh, well, the difference between the first term and the last one. Uh, not necessarily first and last one in your entire time series data. For example, if you read value 1 is 10, uh, you, you just skip it. You need the next value is 12, you take the mean. 10 and 12, the mean is 11. And then you calculate the, now, the difference between the value you have read and the mean. The value of red is 12 and the mean is 11. You say, well, this is within the threshold. You leave the next value, the next value suddenly is 20. You calculate the mean, 20 and 11, the mean will be, will, will it be, will be 16, 16 and a half. And then you say suddenly it's, uh, the difference between now the mean and the value of red is high and that's the change point. And then once it happens, to answer your question, then you stop and you create a new window now again. Uh, there are the different methods. This is the most basic and the most simple one, but there are different different methods uh, for, for change point detections. Some of the more complex ones, uh, uh, one of my colleagues and I have worked on a method uh, using uh, multi chain Monte Carlo methods, like MCNC methods you can use for change detections. But, but depending again on your data and your application, uh, some simple ones could be effective, or you might need some uh, more complex ones, which looks at the multivariate data, distribution of data, makes decisions what is the change. A very good example from this work uh, from uh, Santini and uh, uh, I think it's Kai Romer uh, is uh, 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 they looked at. Uh, uh, wireless sensor networks, and they looked at the, uh, creating some predictive models for sending data or deciding when to send data, when not to send the data. What they do in a very simple form is they look at the data and on the source they create something like a regression model, an interpolation model. And they observe the data for a while and they create an observation, uh, a prediction model, a, a regression or an interpolation model. And they share that model with a sink. Now what happens is, any new value comes, 
they run their prediction model because you have to share that model. You have the model on the device and also you have the model on the cloud. Right? When you read a new value, you calculate it with your regression model and let's say you have read a new value on the sensor itself and the value is 10. You run your regression model, your regression model says the value should be 10.5. And then you make a decision. You say if the error rate is in an acceptable range, you don't send it. Because your counterpart in the cloud has your regression model, can use the regression model artificially to create that data. And then you read the next value comes around, let's say, 12. Your regression model suddenly generates 15. And you will say, well, the person is in the cloud, it runs, this gets 15, this is not accurate, and you decide to send that data. By doing this, sometimes the sensors, they don't send the data, and in the cloud you're artificially using an algorithm, you can generate that data. And then by doing this, you save bandwidth and energy, because sensors, they use more, sensor nodes, they use more energy for sending data than computation. Then you take advantage of that, you let the computation happen on the node, and you run a simple regression model, and that regression model will tell you whether it was to send that data or it doesn't work to send that data. But this method has uh, potentially a problem. Anyone can spot that? But then, well, you're assuming you're always aligned, and if suddenly your model becomes less predictive and the efficiency goes down, you can retrain it and again send the model. Uh, that potentially could be a problem if your the distribution of your data or the accuracy of your model gets, yeah, uh, uh, it is, becomes less accurate over time. That's one problem, but there is also a uh, a significant problem if you don't think about it during your design. What happens if a node breaks down? <laughs> you don't receive data, you're assuming your regression model, your prediction model tells you break and you keep going on, but in practice that node doesn't exist. Uh, then you can think of there again, there are different design modes. You might ping the mode, you might uh, node, you might have to just send one bit. You might send, I don't know, what, something to say actually the node is alive, but the prediction model is correct. There could be different, different ways of doing this. Also, you can look at it in a collaborative way. You can have maybe multiple nodes, they share the model to, with each other, and also over the network, they can uh, help to uh, basically um, uh, improve each other's uh, accuracy in terms of predictions. But in most of the cases, overall, the idea is to take all this data, all these patterns, and convert them to something which we can uh, uh, call this actionable knowledge. We can take it and create an action. Uh, I wanted to do an experiment and try to calculate SACS, and on purpose I put it a few slides later because I could find out people have forgotten what I said. But uh, would you like to try it or should I can continue? Continue. Uh, 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 there, there are some, uh, briefly mentioned this yesterday, there are also some other techniques uh, which you can use. Uh, a few years ago, we looked at uh, the Twitter data, uh, as I mentioned yesterday, we started downloading, uh, 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 looking at the tweets and, uh, around the uh, San Francisco Bay Area, and our idea was, can we use Twitter in information from Twitter to be able to find uh, uh, data related to city events, traffic events in the city? Uh, we looked at uh, using uh, uh, an ontology which was developed by IBM. This was an ontology de describing the events and incidents related to smart cities. But we had some vocabulary. Basically, Scribe Ontology provides a vocabulary. And we also used location names from uh, OpenStreetMaps and uh, 511.org, which provides the traffic incidents. We combine all this to create a set of vocabularies to know about the locations, landmarks in the area we were working, and the traffic incidents that are happening, and create a vocabulary. And then we created a machine learning algorithm, a set of machine learning algorithms, which were taking tweets with people uh, tweeting in that area. And we're analyzing the tweets by looking at, first we did some NLP, we were finding, uh, basically separating, putting the stop words uh, uh, aside, finding these are the annotations once we have processed the data, this is, says B location stands for beginning of location. This seems to be referring to that location within the context of that tweet. 
or is a noun, it is, is an event. Basically, our algorithm looked at doing some NLP uh, natural language processing and some text analysis and trying to identify and label different parts of our tags and tweets. And for that, we used a, a model called conditional random fields. Uh, again, if you're familiar, it's not like, are you familiar with conditional random fields? Or basically, you're looking at the, trying to, uh, in this context, label the, say, this keyword. But to label that, also, you're looking at the labels of the previous things. It's a probabilistic method looking at uh, trying to uh, analyze the text. And our idea was to I'd be able to extract and label the locations, be able to locate the events, and extract this information from uh, our textual information. The end products, which I showed yesterday, was when people were tweeting, they could analyze the tweets, we could find, in not all the cases successfully, but in many cases we could find some of the cases, we could find the location information from the tweet, we could find what people are talking about the event, and we also we were looking at the boundary of something like a geohash area in a boundary box, and we were finding that people were talking about the same event in an area, and we were putting them on the map and saying there is an event happening in this area. And we're providing some context to that event, saying what location is, what's happening, and uh, then you can also, obviously, you can link it to the tweets people have uh, provided, and you can give them, uh, people can see what, what the social media data was behind it. And the green dots were uh, uh, basically information which the 511.org, which is the official uh, channel, was providing about the traffic incident. It was an interesting uh, aspect to this work was when you create like conditional random fields or you're using any such probabilistic machine learning model, uh, a supervised probabilistic machine learning like that, you need to have some labels. You need to be able to have some seed data to be able to train your model before you let your model to go and analyze other data. Uh, there are different ways of doing it. First method is probably you need to have, I don't know, download X number of thousands of, of tweets, manually label them, manually create them, and then feed it to your system and train your model and let the model work. Uh, uh, this is, could be uh, very tedious, it's time consuming, and also the vocabulary could be different. We partially did with some tweets, uh, but we had an interesting source of data. 511.org published all these traffic incidents with location, with some description about the event, with saying what event had happened. And that data comes as XML. Basically, we treated this as our seed data. We told our machine, these are Twitter data, and these are the locations. If you see this text, this is the location. If you see this text, label it as an event. If you see this text, label it as a time. If you text this, this, label it as an app. And we had thousands of them. We fed that data to our machine, basically tricked our machine saying this is, imagine this is our Twitter. And next time, instead of doing 511, the data, we gave the Twitter data. But because there were some similarities to probably the text and locations people were telling, our algorithms were able to use some of that data in to detect or extract some of the information. Again, I mention this because sometimes finding the training data or finding label data could be difficult. Sometimes you just look around, maybe there are some other data sources around can help you to find labels for your data. Very quickly, uh, mm -hmm. a correlation analysis. Again, one of the important things in time series data or analyzing IoT data, if you have two different data streams, how, a, a few data streams, how you look at the correlation between different data sources, how you identify the correlations. Uh, we briefly mentioned the uh, briefly mentioned the work we did by creating virtual documents using SACS, SACS words, and putting it in an LDA context. But there are lots of different techniques. This is an attempt we did uh, a, a couple of years ago, looking at uh, canonical neural networks. Basically, there are double barrel neural networks, and uh, uh, the source is here. You can see the original paper was published in 2000 around 2000. The idea is. This is your first data source. Imagine this is your first data source, and this is your second data source. And for each of them, we create a neural network. Imagine your neural network is, acts like a regression model. Just create your uh, model. And this part of your network, you will give your data, and you will get a U. And then you will use that U. Sorry, I said regression. This is like an you can see this as an autoencoder. You give you and you reconstruct the data. Or you can 
but different variations of it, I, I guess. This is your second data source. You give your second data source, you create a V, and then you use that V in the second part of your algorithm to generate back some output. In canonical neural network, there is only a trick. You train this U or V by some feedback from the other network. It means the outcome of this also is used to training these parameters. It means your network. Uh, the error rate of this is used to train the other method. Basically, when you train the algorithm, you use the error from the previous. Your each network, they see only their own data. Your first network sees their data source one. Your second network sees only data source two. They don't see each other's data. But the part of the training, the error you get from this model, is used in training the parameters for the other model. And that allows the model to learn the correlation between that data. What happens is then later on, if you give this source, you can predict what would be the result of the other source because the model has learned the correlation. And we were trying to use this model for doing correlation analysis, giving like SACS patterns or different data sources. If I had my source one, I start giving my SACS data streams and give the SACS patterns here. These are two separate data sources. Let's say one is temperature, one is humidity. I start learning this U and Vs and I feed the error from this one just so I learn the correlation and I can use that then predicting what are the correlation between this or give one and try to predict the other one. If I have looked at always how temperature and humidity appears in this room and I've learned the correlation, next time when I see the temperature, can I predict what the humidity is going to look like? Something like that. Or by a more multi-dimensional data, more complex data. Uh, we did some measurements, like this shows the mean square error. If you're creating a neural network, you're uh, measuring the mean square error based on each U and V, and looking at the correlation between this data. And if you see, there is no strong correlation. And we did lots of these experiments. And in our data set, we couldn't really find our model to work very effectively to find the correlation between our data sets. And we more or less gave up with this data, and we left this, this method. Uh, can you guess why? This was a work we did that we never published because the correlations were not strong and our model was very difficult to train and actually the, uh, the correlations we were not getting were not very effective. Again, I, I put this for two reasons. Because often when people come and present their work, always they present success. And it seems like everything they did worked. On purpose, I put only one of hundreds of failures we had to say not everything we have tried to work. We have had many failures also in many things we did. But often when you talk, you never talk about the failures. It's important also to acknowledge that because every time you fail with something, you can learn something else or in future you can use uh, it, it somewhere else. This work we started two years ago, uh, or two or three years ago. We failed. We couldn't publish it because the results we were getting for correlation was not very good. And we didn't see any value of data because the model was complex to train and the correlations we were getting were not very good. Later on, we slightly adapted it. We tried it in our work we do in healthcare. Actually, we didn't use it to show this is the best way. We just used it as a base because of the model we had designed in a different way was working better than this. We just showed that you can use this method, but it doesn't work really well. But there, is a, uh, there was a fundamental issue in this, the way we were looking at our experiment, I think, which led us actually to fail. Someone guessed. Our data, uh, which I haven't shown very well here, probably is difficult to see here, was very dynamic means the variation of that data was a lot. The data was varying a lot. And it, across each of the data sources also, they were varying a lot. Because we were working with, uh, 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 I think we were looking at traffic and air quality data, and the traffic is a quite dynamic data. If you're creating neural nets, if you're working with neural nets, then usually you need large samples, it takes time to train them, and the tail of the changes they follow is very slow. If your data changes, your network it takes time to adapt itself. Or as soon as your network adapts itself to a new data distribution, as it starts performing better, suddenly your distribution changes again, your network's uh, performance uh, basically decreases. Uh, and as soon as it tunes to itself, again, like a weekend comes, an event happens in the city, traffic distribution changes, and again, your network is just going up and down. 
doing the same thing, also we were trying to find a correlation, which made it even more complex for our, our, our network. And my guess is that that led uh, to some of the failures in this experiments we were doing. Recently, we picked this one work up, but we looked at the problem not using uh, the, the, the canonical neural networks, looking at a different method. Uh, and what triggered me to think about this again, I came across a paper that was published by DeepMind, uh, and they looked at a, a phenomenon called catastrophic forgetting. What they did, uh, uh, they trained an, uh, an Atari game uh, to a computer, to a neural network. Some of you probably are too young to remember our tires. Uh, 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 and uh, this, uh, the computer learned, the neural network model learned to play the game. Then they gave the second game to, uh, to the same model. Well, uh, if you do that, the, uh, the computer starts learning the second game, but forgets the uh, second game and starts adapting. And then they brought back the first game, it couldn't play it because that's forgotten. The parameters are tuned to the second one. And in general, in machine learning, that, that's and I'm sort of referred to as catastrophic forest. Now, what, what, uh, they have a very, uh, a very interesting paper. I recommend going to have a look there using uh, like some uh, Markovian models uh, and uh, solve that problem. But that triggers us to think of, can we actually look at neural network models which can adapt uh, to the changes of data and the tail of your network? Let's say your network performs really well and your results are very accurate. So then your data changes and your network's performance drops. And again, you learn, you perform well, so then your data and drops. But we were trying to reduce this drop in our performance, the performance of our networks. And we started looking at, can I create a network instead of suddenly if my data changes, like right? a little like this. And creating some dynamic models. For this, we combine different uh, uh, Bayesian machine learning, different techniques to actually to make our networks more adaptable if you're using neural network models. This is a research we have started recently, a few months ago, and we have been looking at using different techniques to provide that. I just wanted to add this to say, when you are looking at your experiments, sometimes if it doesn't, it doesn't work, you might need, uh, sometimes you don't give up, like similar to the silhouette coefficient, which we didn't give up till until we found the solution. Sometimes maybe you actually decide it's the time to give up, and maybe later on you come across something else, you can leap back to your work and carry on from where you have left. Or sometimes it could be just a good lesson. The last point in my slides today is the uh, uh, but it's the concept of supervised and unsupervised learning. In uh, many cases, when you're trying to extract information from uh, IoT data or time series data or to create patterns, sometimes you need label data. Well, a, a, tutor, a, a tutor example was one of us when we were tra uh, tra uh, training our uh, CRF models, we needed to have some label data. Uh, but often, labeling data is not an easy task. Giving you an example, I'll talk about it more tomorrow. Uh, we have an algorithm in our uh, dementia, uh, Alzheimer's testbed, IoT testbed. We have an algorithm that looks at different parameters we collect from our participants and the body vital signals, and we detect uh, infection, a, a sort of infection called urinary tract infection. That's a case which, uh, in people with dementia, is one of the top five reasons for them to be admitted to hospital. And if you detect it early, if you get, if you can, like, they can go and see their GP, they can get an antibiotics and can be easily treated. If it gets undiagnosed, the infection can uh, become serious, they might uh, to, uh, a serious health uh, risk and they might be admitted to hospital. It takes time. Uh, it is not that easy uh, it's the experience for the patients and for the carers and also the health risks. Uh, we are trying to create a machine learning algorithm. Uh, to be able to look at different parameters. We are measuring people's sleep, a uh, number of times they go to the bathroom, their body temperature, their pattern of movement, uh, several uh, uh, features we are adding together continuously. We are training a model to look at and identify the risk of UTI. Uh, the problem we had was uh, we needed some training data. We needed to our machines to show some examples to say, if you see this, this is a urinary tract infection, this is not a urinary tract infection. When we started doing this work, nobody had done it before. There wasn't any data source. When I, we talked to our clinicians, they said, well, they have their own tests, but they have never used in-home sensory data or using these markers to detect it. They think these are the good symptoms. You can monitor and observe the symptoms. 
but we didn't have any uh, training data. What we did, we sent an Excel form, we wrote all these markers, we sent an Excel form to our clinical uh, colleagues, we asked them to add some uh, artificially synthesized data to say, if you see this down, if I go to the bathroom 10 times at night, if my sleeping patterns are like X, if I'm, my body temperature is Y, and see, you will say this is a UTI or this is not a UTI. They were kind enough, they created like a few hundred samples for us. The problem was that sample was still very biased as a human artificially created data. That wasn't enough for us to, uh, to use that data. We started working with that, and over time we started looking at some unsupervised learning model. I'll talk more about this tomorrow. But once we started actually creating an algorithm and put it in practice, we use it actually in, in real uh, service and we work with the, uh, with, the, with the patients and their families, uh, we had around, we detected around uh, six cases. In terms of healthcare, we had around like, uh, when we designed this algorithm, we had around 40 participants in our case and we had, we detected uh, six cases. That's quite a lot in four months period of time. Uh, means around 10 12 percent of, of occurrence, and that's more or less the picture. Probably around that number of people between six to eight to ten people with that high UTI, and we detected six. That was in, uh, in terms of the algorithmic looking at it, the algorithm was working well. The problem was for a machine learning algorithm, six samples is not that much. You hear all the time about big data, and people say. Well, you know, we have lots of data, we can train it, but sometimes actually in reality you might have a lot of data, but you might have a very, very small number of uh, label data. In terms of the markers we monitor, we have probably tens of or not hundred thousands of that samples. The only problem is you could only have six of them, you label them correctly. And we had 34 cases which we had detected and were, were not correct. And we knew for sure 34 cases are not correct and six cases are correct based on the data we have. But that's not enough. And usually machine learning, you can train an algorithm, it, it can work, but we wanted to find something which uh, improves our, our, our solution. Uh, uh, this is a work we haven't published, and I'm recording this, okay, I'll say how we did it. Uh, we looked at a, a solution looking at uh, unsupervised, uh, a combination of unsupervised and supervised learning, which is a machine learning called semi-supervised learning. What we do, if we are monitoring, let's say, I call them feature here, feature one, feature two, feature three, feature four, let's say this is body temperature, number of times people go to bathroom, uh, their sleep patterns, I don't know, the movement patterns. We had a lot of data which we didn't have labels. We fed this to a neural network model, and if you're interested, that was a convolutional neural network. We fed this data to a convolutional neural network, and we had, let's say, an a data, an n-dimensional data, you can create something, an m-dimensional data, you can create another n-dimensional data. In our case, it was n to n. Just gave it, uh, we started basically a convolutional net. It, if you're familiar with CNN, that's an autoencoder. Basically, you create, sorry, when I say n-dimensional data in middle, you have obviously smaller dimension. I just dropped that part. You give your data, you create a smaller dimension, and you use that smaller dimension to recreate it again. We gave it and we created an autoencoder model. Once we had that, we had a lot of unlabeled data. We gave that unlabeled data thousands of them, and our algorithm learned the correlation between different parameters. We learned how to represent that data in lower dimensions. That didn't need any supervision. That didn't need any, but in terms of supervision, that didn't need any labels. Once we have that, we are now using, we have learned how the parameters are, they work, and how we can re represent our data in a lower dimension in a much better, more efficient way because we have lots of samples to learn that and to learn that representation. Now we drop this model, we use only that representation, and we use it with a, uh, with a supervised machine learning. If you're interested, for this we are using a Gaussian process with logical regression. And that's basically a, a binary classifier. They look at data that say someone has an infection or doesn't have an infection. That changed our accuracy of algorithm around from 12% to something around 70% based on the historical data we had. 
Uh, I used this example to say uh, uh, sometimes if you combine some uh, techniques to each other or look at the problem in a different way, you might come up with interesting solutions for the problem which seems to be really sometimes intractable or sometimes difficult to do. In our case, uh, urinary tract infection is not something people will have very often, but something very important. And the sample we, were, we can monitor, if you had like uh, monitoring 10,000 people, would that be easier to collect lots of examples? But that's usually resource uh, uh, consuming. It's very complicated to run a trial, of, like a clinical trial with 10,000 people. You need lots of resources to do that. And our sample set was much smaller, but that meant the number of labels we could create was smaller. By combining some uh, 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 simple machine techniques, machine learning techniques, and combining supervised and semi-supervised learning, it helped our algorithms to be trained and, and learned uh, in a much better way. Well, at least in this case, it, it helped us a lot. Then, if you're when you're considering any data-driven solution for any IoT, it's good to have a very clear and right assumption and hypothesis. Looking at the problem, looking at the domain, and trying to really think, is this the right way? Is this the right data set I have? Is this the right problem I'm going to solve? And I try to give you today some examples of that, and tomorrow we'll try to provide a few more. And also talking to experts, looking at back, background knowledge, ex looking, talking to experts in that domain, trying to understand what type of information, if you extract, will be useful. And also focusing on the dynamicity aspect and creating algorithms which can be effective, can be adaptive, can change the comparative distribution of data. Again, I provided some examples of that, how you can create adaptive clusterings, I don't know, adaptive creating patterns, looking at uh, uh, changes in data and uh, adapting your algorithms automatically depending on how your data changes. And also looking at the complementary sources. Are there any complementary sources which you can use your data? Or semi-supervised learning was an example of how you can use uh, uh, complementary sources. Or you can use complementary sources similar to what we did in from 111.org, which we didn't have labeled data. We treated the information that we're publishing as sort of our training uh, seed for training our conditional uh, 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 random fields. And obviously what we need, we need to look at models which they are working based on some uh, concrete evidence and also based on the current assumption. And I tried instead of, of like using some magic, we are trying to follow logical steps to create our algorithm and to create something concrete. Then obviously there are uh, lots of other areas I didn't talk about them uh, today. I talked a lot, but uh, there are some important aspects when you're analyzing data. Uh, they are, I acknowledge they are very important and they are again integral part of the designing for solutions for data analytics for IoT, but within the today's uh, time I didn't talk much about any of them. Some acknowledgements for some of the sources I used today and thank you very much. Any questions?